Hello and welcome to this introductory lecture. Uh, today we're going to be thinking a little bit about the difference between what you should think and how you should think and how learning how to think can help prepare you for the real world as well as thinking about strange things. When you were a kid, you probably asked your parents a lot of questions. Some of those questions may have sounded a little bit funny to adult ears. Often those questions begin with a why. Uh, things like, why do birds fly? Why is the apple red? Why can't I have dessert before dinner? <laughs> um, but as you grow older, you tend to become much less inquisitive, right? By the end of high school, your age probably currently, you don't find yourself asking these kinds of why questions on a day-to-day -day basis. Why do you think that that's so? Like, why do you think that you've stopped? It's it, not as if you've answered all of those why questions, have you? Does it matter that you don't ask those why questions anymore? And ultimately, like, you know, who cares? Who, who, who cares whether or not we ask these kinds of questions? Sadly, a loss of inquisitiveness can often lead to a sense of complacency. Not asking why all the time puts one in the situation of less expectation. The modern education system sort of of youth, you know, K through 12, it isn't really designed to foster inquisitiveness. And this may be a flaw, this may be a problem with the system itself, it may also just be a fact that there's too much information that you need to know uh, as a modern adult to spend a lot of time sitting around contemplating why certain things happen or giving the complicated explanations that are needed for someone to actually understand why things happen. You kind of have to have a large base of basic how things are knowledge before you can even start to really understand why certain things are the way that they are. Also, asking why all the time just isn't always useful or helpful or productive or proactive in any way. It doesn't fit what we might think of uh, lovingly or uh, you know derisively as the capitalist model of living, where everything that you do needs to be in some way commodified or useful or helpful in optimizing your output uh, your productivity. It reminds me of uh, the philosopher Plato, or Socrates, Plato's teacher. He's sort of the the er philosopher, Socrates. He walked around uh, ancient Athens, asking people questions all the time, and pushing them in their thinking. He eventually was sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of all things, but. He claimed to not really be knowledgeable about anything. He just walked around asking why all the time. And while he is a famous philosopher today, uh, you might question whether or not he was good at anything other than stirring up questioning uh, issues and you know, bothering people. This is ultimately a tragedy that most of you, many of you, have probably lost much of your inquisitiveness about the world. Luckily, this tragedy can be rectified. It can be rectified in a class like this, where instead of trying to tell you what you need to know, we're going to try and teach you how to learn again, how to be inquisitive, and how to go about attempting to answer questions that start with why uh, in a way that is helpful and useful. Also, when you were a kid, you probably weren't very good at asking why questions, right? If somebody was to answer your why question with something other than just because, um, you probably weren't equipped to remember or fully understand the causal reasoning or fully understand how the explanation fit with the question that you were asking. So now, 
hopefully you are prepared to actually kind of stay with these kinds of explanations. And so with the tools that we're going to try to give you in this class, you will be able to regain your ability to understand and ask why questions as well as go forward into the world and determine the answers for yourself. Some of you, on the other hand, never really lost that inquisitive spirit, but you probably weren't fostered in how to think while you were coming up through, you know, elementary school through high school. So if you stayed inquisitive and were wondering about why things were the way that they were, there's a good chance that you may have at some point fallen victim to one form or another of bad thinking, over explaining certain things, appealing to conspiracy theories, something along those lines. I know this happened to me when I was younger, but don't worry, we all think poorly some of the time. The issue with bad thinking is not the bad thinking, right? because that can always be corrected. The issue is being unable or unwilling to see the error of your thinking and correct it. Kind of like this guy here. This is Giorgio Tsoukalos, who, if you haven't seen the show, is uh, often portrayed on Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. I don't know why it's on the History Channel. The History Channel seems to have stopped caring about history. But Giorgio here um, is a purveyor of the pseudoscientific belief that aliens must be the explanation for how certain often prehistoric things came to be, like the building of the pyramids or um, things like, you know, uh, other large formations that people were able to put together back before uh, modern technology. Now, this is of course a hypothesis that Giorgio is putting forward, which if we could show that there were aliens that had massive technological improvement and that they had visited Earth, sure, maybe it would be somewhat more plausible. The issue with uh, Tsoukalos's claim more often than not is that basically what he wants to say is something like the mere possibility of the fact that it could be the case that aliens visited earth and helped set up the pyramids is a good reason for thinking that they did so that is a reach and the way that that's a reach is something that we're going to look into more this is a problematic form of reasoning, a problematic form of thinking, thinking that the mere possibility of something is a good reason for thinking that it must be true. Fostering a healthy level of skepticism is good to sort of help keep your own mental health, in a sense, uh, about you. Being skeptical in a lot of situations can act as a, something like a mental vaccine, right? It, it stops you uh, from being susceptible to bullshit. <laughs> um, when people make outlandish claims or just even regular claims that seem a little bit funny, you can always ask why. And asking for reasons uh, is good because it helps you to determine whether or not the information that the person that you're thinking about is selling uh, has something like evidence behind it or is rather sus suspect, right? You always need to ask why, uh, usually a few levels down, before you'll get to something. And, and it ultimately, if the person offers you information or something that just seems wildly outland outlandish, hard to believe to be true as the reasoning behind what you're asking for, then you know that you can be legitimately skeptical. Now, for this class, it's sort of just the case that the weirder a case is, uh, the better for trying to find missing answers to these why questions. Um, finding the missing answers or finding the suspect answers that they might give. But remember, for each wild and crazy thing that's 
we're going to talk about in this class or that you might come come across there are of course people out there that believe these things now you might ask why they believe these things and there's a number of different reasons but some might just take these beliefs on a kind of faith as something that has to be true <clears throat> but i want to be clear here that there's a difference between forms of reasonable faith and forms of unreasonable faith. There are ultimately some things in the end that we probably do have to take on faith. It's not the case that everything can be explained or that everything can be proven. I mean, just think, I don't know, there's a recent, the recent Matrix movie came out uh, and like, it's really hard to say that you know you're not in the Matrix. Um, you know, <laughs> reality would seem just as it is. Uh, but we generally take on something like faith that we're not in the matrix. So, but that's a kind of reasonable form of faith. Whereas believing that aliens built the pyramids on the basis of your faith that aliens built the pyramids, that, that's starting to hinge uh, the other direction. Before we go any further, I want to take a second though to respond to a form of relativism that some of you might be tempted by at this point. Now, of course, you know, Giorgio here um, has some, what seems like a outlandish or crazy belief, but you might think, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Yeah, but you know, it's his belief. He can believe whatever he wants. And maybe that aliens built the pyramids, that's true for him. It's not true for me, but it's true for him. Um, nothing is ultimately objectively true and so, you know, what's true for him is true for him, and he can live his life that way. That's a form of relativism, to think that nothing is ultimately objectively true, and that what's true for you is true for you, but what's true for me is different. Objectivism and subjectivism are different ways of thinking about truth and the relationship between truth and human subjects. Objectivism says that there are objective truths, truths that are out there independent of subjects, independent of individual minds, and that those truths exist to sort of be found, to be known. Whereas extreme versions of subjectivism, relativism, say that all truth is relative to the believing subject, that there are no independent truths than, uh, other than the things that people think are true. Now, this extreme form of relativism ultimately fails because it's just self-defeating. Um, the view can't stand on its own two legs because it claims objective truth in subjective truth. Right? It, it, you can always ask someone that thinks this way whether or not it's objectively true, that is true sort of independent of anyone, whether or not nothing is objectively true because uh, that's what they're claiming. And if they want to sort of continue to say yes, you say, well, what about, you know, what if it's true to me that there are some objective truths? And you'll get them going down a sort of rabbit hole that's difficult to come back from. Now, there's nothing, this is not to say that uh, all forms of relativism are implausible. There are certain kinds of relativism, uh, in particular when it comes to uh, tastes. Um, there are theories in morality that uh, lean relativistic that, that are more or less plausible. But when we are talking here about truth, we are going to assume a very basic form of objective truth. That basic form of objective truth is just this sort of really bare bones, basic foundational kind of truth that comes from the fact that, you know, you're listening to a video right now um, that, you know, you have hands, that, you know, the apple in front of you is red, right? Those basic truths that are unassailable, uh, that's where we're starting from. Those objective truths are true no matter what, and we're going, that's where we're going to build our critical thinking on top of uh, this assumption. Now, as this class goes forward, I hope you are able to sort of enjoy the examples as well as get some work in and you know learn something of course the fun part of the class will be 
the examples that we are going to be using, right? People's beliefs in things that are more outlandish, like aliens or ghosts, astrology, and magic. But while we're doing that, we're going to be assessing certain methods and techniques for correct or good reasoning. Uh, and those things are going to involve things like the search formula, which I'll we'll talk about momentarily, argument types, certain kinds of formal logical reasoning, uh, certain kinds of inductive log logical reasoning, and fallacies. So, and those are the things that ultimately you're going to be on the hook for when it comes to quizzes and exams. To begin with, while thinking about the more outlandish examples that we're going to be going over, I want you to use this sort of critical assessment tool that's put forward in the text uh, in chapter seven. Um, this is what they call the search formula, which is a little bit uh, tortured, but it sort of makes sense once you think about it. Um, the search formula is to do these, sort of follow these four steps when you're coming across some outlandish claim or set of beliefs uh, that someone is trying to push onto you. And the first step there is, of course, to state the claim uh, as clearly as possible, recognizing what exactly it is that someone is trying to get you to believe or what exactly it is that the person themselves believes on the basis of what it is that they're thinking. Um, then, of course, you must examine the evidence for the claim. That's the answer to the why question, to the why should you believe the claim in the first place. Hopefully there's some kind of evidence for that claim. Then you can consider the alternatives, right? The alternatives uh, are other kinds of hypotheses, other kinds of explanations that one might give that would result in the truth of the claim if the truth itself is based in re reality, based on evidence, or alternative hypotheses that depend, you know, that 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 put the truth on the evidence for the claim. So there's different kinds of hypotheses that can be made here, that can be alternatives, that can be explained. And once you've got sort of a set of hypotheses, you can then try to rate those hypotheses uh, according to uh, criteria of adequacy, um, whether or not the hypothesis is good or, or not, um, you can rate each hypothesis and then to try and determine which one is the most likely. Now I want you to be sure to read uh, chapter 7 and the description of each aspect of the search formula, and then the case study on homeopathy and the claim that's being made in the alternative hypothesis that ultimately uh, homeopathy, if anything, makes people feel better due to uh, different kinds of effects like the placebo effect. Uh, next week in our lectures and readings, we're going to be discussing and thinking about the nature of what is possible and what is impossible, uh, ranging all the way from logical possibility to uh, actual physical possibility. Uh, and we're going to be discussing Aristotle and the way that Aristotle put forward what we might call the laws of logical thinking. And that's enough for now for this introductory lecture. Uh, see you in the next one.